worship. We've come out of um, what's called Matariki, which is, uh, is the, uh, the Māori New Year, and I think officially it was uh, Wednesday, the 15th of July was when that kind of uh, officially finished. But Matariki is uh, it's a cluster of stars in the night sky. Um, some may know it as Pleiades or, uh, or, um, or the Subaru logo on the car. Uh, but that cluster of stars, uh, uh, Matariki, represents the, the Māori New Year. And it's, it is uh, the time where, where, we, we, where the days have been getting shorter and then they start to get longer again. And so with that, um, it's a great picture because it brings that sense of hope. 
and sense of expectation that we are, uh, even though it doesn't, may not feel like it, we're moving towards spring. We're moving, we're getting, we're one day closer, we're getting towards, uh, and it speaks of new life, hope, expectation. And, and I think, you know, like we've all been through, um, you know, like there's a lot going on. And, you know, I think what we really need is a sense of hope. We need the sense to be able to move forward into the future with, with expectation that, and in our faith journey as individuals and even as a church, that, that there are great things ahead. You know, like we've got to get excited about what is ahead. You know, that God still has good things ahead for us in our own journey and also as, as a church family, there are great things ahead. It's so important. Um, it's so important that uh, we, we think that way. Um, and, uh, and I was, um, myself and Shane, um, we meet each week on a Tuesday afternoon and, and we sort of talk about what's going on in the life of the church. So Shane, uh, his official title was CSM, Core Sergeant Major. He's like, uh, I'd say, the senior lay leader of the church. And so we, we chew the fat, we talk about stuff, we, we, uh, and, and there is a lot going on for people in the life of this church. But one of the things we, we make sure we do is we spend time in prayer. We, we pray and we, we pray together. We pray for, for uh, uh, different people with things that are going on and we bring these things before God and it's a great time. Uh, one of the highlights of my week is just spending that time before God praying. And, uh, um, and this week, uh, while Shane was praying, um, we were just bringing uh, situations, bringing SAJ Church family to God uh, while Shane was praying. Uh, a verse came to mind for me, and it was Haggai chapter 2, uh, verse 9. So when Shane finished, I, I was sort of quickly trying to find Haggai and saying, where, where is Haggai? And it's uh, one of the little minor prophets. But Haggai chapter 2, verse 9 says this. It says, The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. And it was this picture of, you know, like with sense of sometimes when, when we talk about all that's going on, we can, we can feel a little bit weighed down. We can feel like, man, you know, we can be a bit discouraged. But this, as, as Shane was praying and this word came to mind, it was, it was a, it's a picture of hope. It's a picture of hope, you know, moving forward. Um, the glory of the present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. The glory speaks of the splendor of God's presence. It speaks of his hand upon us. And, uh, you know, and so, so it is glory. And when we, when we as a church, we look back, you know, there's a sense that, yes, we see God's hand upon this place. You know, we're coming up to 25 years. Uh, we're going to be celebrating that later in September, celebrating 25 years as a church. And, and as we reflect on the journey, yes, there's been glory. Yes, we've seen God's hand. We've seen great things happen. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that. But as we turn and look ahead to the future, we've got to believe that, that our best days are not behind us. We've got to believe that. Even as great as they were, we've got to believe that greater things are yet to come. Whatever heights we've reached in the past, we're going to, we're going to move higher in God. You know, whatever levels of breakthrough we've, we've experienced in the past, we've got to believe for even greater levels of breakthrough moving forward. We've got to believe that. It's so important that we believe that, that our best days are still before us as a church. Why is it so important? Because what we believe will determine how we live. What we believe will determine how we live. And if, you know, churches get stuck on this. Because if we believe that our best days are behind us, then we'll be, we'll be stuck. We'll be wanting to get back to how we used to do it. This is what we used to do. We've got to get back to doing it. And, and you know, a lot of churches get stuck on this. They, they believe. They're not so sure that we can do better in the future. One of the biggest enemies that, to the church, you know, sometimes we, 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 uh, we've got to understand is, is the sentimental attachment to something that God is no longer breathing on. Now, that might seem harsh, but, but God is always moving. He's always on the move. He's always doing new things. He's the God of new things. And sometimes we get attached to something back here and think, this was amazing. This was incredible. When actually God has moved on, he's doing something here. And so we've got to be careful we don't get stuck. Back there. We celebrate the past. Yes, God's hand has been upon the journey, but we look forward and we believe with hope and expectation that great things are still to come. And so I think that's a little bit of, like, you know, as it came to me, I think that's a little bit of prophetic, the sense that, yes, great things are still to come. We celebrate the glory, God's hand, 
But we've got to believe that, that, you know, that the generations still to come, they're going to go even higher. They're going to go even further for God and for his kingdom in the days to come. Another element of Matariki um, that I really love is this. Not only does it bring with it a sense of hope and expectation moving forward, but it also it takes time to remember those who are no longer with us. Uh, remembering people who have um, who have passed on, and and a key part of Matariki is is taking time to do that, and not not just remember, but honouring you know those who have gone before us and allowing their life to propel us into into the new season, to even stir us and motivate us as we as we live our life, you know, and and in our faith journey, remembering those who have gone before us. And not just remembering them, but allowing you know, people who are, who are no longer with us, who have lived their life for God, allowing their life, the way they live for God, to, to inspire us in our life as we live for God. And this was a real key part of Hebrew culture. Hebrew culture was very much you know, like they, they allowed those who had gone before them in the faith to, to inspire them, to, to stir something in them as they... Would live their life, and this is, uh, you know, like in um, in Hebrews chapter eleven, the writer of Hebrews, he in, in chapter eleven he will talk. It's called the faith chapter, and it's just uh, really all the writer is doing is taking us on a journey through through a number of different men and women who were uh, um, men and women of faith, and some of them are named. You'll see their names. Others are unnamed. But it's just this journey. The whole chapter, Hebrews 11, is about men and women who have, who have, who have run the race for God, who have lived by faith, who, who have devoted their life to him. And, uh, and, and just paints a picture, just gives us a glimpse of these different people. And then Hebrews chapter 12 um, begins by saying, Therefore, uh, you know, when, you, when you're studying, you, you always ask, what is the theref- therefore, therefore? And uh, so what is the therefore? Therefore, It's there because it links Hebrews 11 to Hebrews 12. It's saying, uh, keeping your eyes on everything you've just read in Hebrews 11, that's basically what it is. Keep your eyes on everything you've just read. All those people that you've just had a glimpse of their life as they've lived for faith, keep your eyes on them. And then it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Everyone know we're running a race. Do you know that? We're all running a race. This, this faith journey is, a, is a, we're running. <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, and, and the key to being able to run for God, the key to be able to give our best for God as we live our life for Him, is we've got to keep our eye the writer of Hebrews is saying, keep your eye on those who've gone before you. If you want to be able to give your best, you know, if you, if you lose sight of the men and women, the great men and women of faith who've gone before us, then, then you may not run. You might, it might just be a bit of a, a canter, or you may even walk. Because keeping your eyes on the people who've gone before you inspires us. It, it stirs us. To be able to pick up a bit of speed. You know, you read about, oh yeah, look what they did for God. You pick up a bit of speed. Look what they did for God. You pick up some more speed. And all of a sudden, as you as you sit in the stories of men and women who have gone before us, it, it propels us, it motivates us, it stirs us in our faith journey. You know, like the writer of Hebrews is just he's really just effectively saying, you know, as as we keep our eyes on that great cloud of witnesses, that as we as we Look at their life. Use their life to inspire our life in the now. <clears throat> and so a question, good question to ask is, who is it in that great cloud of witnesses that, that really spurs you on in your faith journey? And you know, that might be you know, one of the people in Hebrews 11. It might be a, a Bible character. It might be someone from the history books of the church, a revivalist, someone that, that uh, or maybe even a loved one who, who has recently been going to be with the Lord. You know, their life inspires you. But who is it that, that when you reflect, when you read about them, when you hear some of the stories about them, stirs you 
um, in your faith. I put this down. Most passionate people for God today will talk about their heroes, will talk about the men and women of faith that inspired them. You get close to anyone who's, who's passionate for God, they will, they'll start sharing the stories of the men and women that, that stir them, that motivate them. You know, like if, if we get to a place, if we ever come to a point where we're, we're lacking motivation or we're just drifting in our faith journey, you know, and uh, I don't know, maybe you've never been there, but if you've ever been there, if you've ever found, man, I'm just, I'm just coasting along, well, a great way to stir your faith is to actually pick up a history book, read about a revivalist, read about uh, you know, some, some of the men and women of the Bible, allow their lives to motivate you and stir you afresh. So how do we know when someone has really inspired you? Well, this is what I believe. If you know, you know when someone's really inspired you, is that you begin to pray the prayer, God, what you did in their life, do it again in me. If it brings us to our knees, if it brings us to a place where we pray, God, the, the life they lived, the way you moved in that person, the way you moved upon that person, God, would you do it again in me? That's how you know you're really inspired. I felt led to share this story this morning. Um, uh, and uh, some of you may know the story, but I just really sensed to, to share it. Uh, and it's about this, this, this young group of students who um, they travelled from the US over to the UK, and obviously not in present climate, uh, a number of years ago this happened. This group of students travelled from the US to the UK and, and the bus loaded them, 30 or 40, 40 of them on this bus, and they went over there to tour um, different historical uh, places in the UK. That was the reason they were there, and so they were stopping at different places. And one of the places they were going to stop was at um, um, the residence of John Wesley. John Wesley, who, you know, revivalist, reformer, he was, he was a great man of God who, who uh, just was a catalyst for, for change and for bringing new life uh, into the church. Some really incredible things happened through John Wesley. And we know him from Methodism today. But in his, in his heyday, John Wesley, he was radical. He was a revivalist. He, would, uh, um, he couldn't find buildings uh, big enough. They couldn't find tents large enough to contain the number of people. Thousands of people would travel from all around um, England to come and, and listen to John Wesley. He used to say, I, I would set myself on fire and people would come to watch me burn. And, uh, and, you know, and, and, so, and, and so they would have to go and meet in the, in the fields, in the open fields, because they didn't have a place large enough and thousands of people would gather in and he'd preach the word of God and people would, would come to faith. People would have incredible encounters with, with the Spirit of God. And, uh, and so they, part of the tour was to, to visit uh, the residents. And so the bus pulls up and they go into this, uh, this place and they walk into the, into, the, into the residence and there's the place where the dining room, and this was the place. The tour guide says, this is where John Wesley would have his, sit down and have his meal. And the student's like, wow, incredible, you know, John Wesley would eat here in this table. And, and then they carry on the tour and they go along to another room and it's a study and this is where John Wesley would, would he would prepare his sermons. You know, he would, he would sit in this room and, and you know, the students are just in awe of, of uh, being in the same place, the very same place where John Wesley would sit and prepare his sermons. And then, um, you know, then he, they'd head off um, up some stairs to a, down a hallway and there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a, the sleeping quarters where, where John Wesley would, would sleep and so they open the door and there... There's this bed and, and there's this mat next to the bed and, and it's got a couple of holes in it, uh, in the mat. And, and one of the students asked the tour guide, what, what's the story with the two holes? And, and the tour guide says, well, that's where John Wesley would kneel. And he would spend hours on his knees and he would, he would cry out to God and say, God, would you use me? Use me as an instrument of righteousness. Use me to bring revival to New England that, that people would be saved. And he would pray and cry out to God for revival. And, uh, and the students were just in awe, you know, wow, you know, to kneel for long enough, you know, uh, to have, have holes in, in the carpet. I mean, we, we have holes in our jeans these days, but that's just the fashion thing. But they, uh, here, here is holes in the carpet. Um, and, uh, and, you know, from, from kneeling to pray. And, and so, uh, so, so the students are in awe. And, but then it's time, you know, they've got to... Got to head back to the bus and, uh, and carry on with their tour. And so they head, head off and climb onto the bus, about to drive away. And there's one student who's, 
who uh, is not accountable for. And so the tour guide has to jump off the bus, go back in, and he's looking around to find this last student and uh, nowhere downstairs, and so heads upstairs and, and then can hear the sound of, of the student um, crying out to God in, in prayer. And, and it's coming from the sleeping quarters. And so the tour guide pushes the door open and sure enough, there is a student and he's put his knees into the very same holes in the carpet that, that John Wesley had knelt in. And he's praying and he's, he's crying out to God and saying, God, God, would you use me the way you use John Wesley? God, would you do it again in me? Use me to bring revival. Use me to, to, to make a difference in this world. God, use me as an instrument of righteousness. Do it again. The same way you used John Wesley. Do it again in me. And, and it was a precious moment. You know, The tour guide didn't want to interrupt this time, but knew that the bus was waiting. So went and placed his hand on the student's shoulder and, and said, you know, we've really got to get going. And, and in that moment, the 17, 18-year-old lad it was, a, it was a young Billy Graham who would get up off his knees and go and join the rest of the students on the bus. Billy Graham, who we know, you know, would touch millions with the message of the gospel. But he was inspired in a moment by the life of John Wesley to say, God, would you do it again in me? The way you used him, do it again in me. And I think, you know, it's so important, as I said before, that each one of us have someone. Who is it? That inspires you. Who is it that you know you would go back to the place you'd you'd read about their life, you'd you'd hear the stories that would stir something in you so that you would run your race, run for God, give your best for Him as you live for Him. Well, there was a time in my life where, um, believe it or not, I began to drift, and and um, you know, as a young guy, I suppose I was around. 20s, late 20s, mid to late 20s, and, and I came to a point where I, I felt that, you know, for me it was, it was time to move on from the Salvation Army, you know, step, step down from soldiership and, and leave the Salvation Army. I was, I was lacking, lacking motivation, and, and, um, but I still had my faith. Um, I still had my faith, and, and I, was, I was looking around, and, and part of the reason that I was looking to, to leave was, was about the fact that I, I was... Um, I was going to be interviewed for it to become a youth pastor at another church, at a uh, church in Rotorua. And so it wasn't that I'd lost my faith, it was just I was a little bit lacking in motivation as in, within the Salvation Army. And about that time was when I discovered uh, in the history books of the Salvation Army a guy by the name of um, Elijah Cadman. Has anyone heard of Elijah Cadman? Um, if you go to the, the place where William Booth and Catherine Booth are, are buried, that you'll see that right next to them is the headstone of, of Commissioner Elijah Cadman. He didn't start as a commissioner. He started as a, as a corps officer, a, um, a captain, I think. Well, he started even before the military uh, terminology came into play. So I guess he started as a pastor, and he, and he was part of... Uh, he pastored in this church, and as I read about the way that he... Uh, what would happen in, in, in these meetings? You know, it was just like he was the most radical core officer I've ever read about or heard of. He, you know, like just the, the way that God moved was incredible. You know, it was like uh, the glory of God would show up. People would, there were always people getting saved. There were always miracles happening. Lives were being transformed. And I just became captivated, uh, inspired by the life of this man, Elijah Cadman. In fact, when, um, when we went to college, uh, to train to be officers, BCM out in Upper Hutt. What I would do is I would spend time in the library. Um, no one else was around. I'd, I'd just pull out the old war cries, pull out the history books, and I'd be looking for stories about Elijah Cadman, this man of God. And as I would read, I'd find that, you know, like I'd almost be, be like uh, Billy Graham. I'd be thinking, God, what you did in this man, do it again in me. Because that's how you know you're really inspired, is when you pray that prayer, God, would you the way you moved in this man's life, would you do it again in me? And the key thing that motivated me was the fact that it was the glory, the splendor of God's presence would be there in the meetings, in the times together. The glorious presence of God in such a way that everyone knew. You know, no one would leave the meetings, you know, Elijah Cadman meeting, not knowing that that they'd met with God. God showed up. And I long for that. As you know, you know I've talked about I long for, for us to be, 
to, to leave this place on a Sunday and without a doubt knowing we've met with God, knowing that we've encountered His glorious presence. Romans chapter 12 verse 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The Passion Translation says it a little differently. It says, Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward Him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let Him fill you with excitement as you serve Him. Kind of expands it out a little bit more, but spiritual fervor. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. It's possible to serve the Lord without spiritual fervor. And it's also important not to. It's important to serve the Lord with spiritual fervor because when we serve the Lord, we're representing Him. Now the way we serve Him uh, tells a story about our God to the person we're serving. And as we, we serve God before people, we represent our God and, and the, best, the best thing we can offer another person is, is spiritual fervor is to show them that our God is incredible, that we, we're passionate, we love our God. And, and here's the reality, is that we're all responsible for our own spiritual fervor. We're all responsible for our level for passion, for God. You know, we can't uh, look to someone else to, you know, we can't, you know, it's, it's you. You've got to make the choices. You've got to make the decisions. What am I going to do to keep my spiritual fervor alive? Well, I'm suggesting this morning um, pull out the Bible, pull out the history books, read about men and women of God who laid down their life for Him, who lived for Him passionately and allowed their lives to stir something in us at this time. So we're going to sing a song this morning. It's, uh, it's a great song um, about the glory of God. His, your glory is so beautiful. And I, I want, as we sing the song, maybe just take a moment to... to you know, I believe that many of you in this room, there are people that you know who have, who have gone on, who are now in the presence of God, who have inspired you. Who, when you think of their life, you know, they, they uh, were a role model for you and your faith. And just as, you know, as part of Matariki is actually taking time to, to think about those people, to honour them, to remember, but also allowing them to stir something afresh in your journey. And so I thought as we, just before we sing, let's take a moment to maybe think about those people, those men and women that have inspired you. And just take a moment to thank God for them. Thank God for their life. And, and then pray, God, the way that you moved in their life, God, would you do it again in me? Stir something in me afresh this morning. So why don't we do that? Just before we sing, just take a moment to, to thank God Think about those men and women who have inspired you, who, have, who are no longer with us. Maybe someone quite recently who, who uh, you know, a loved one. Or maybe it's someone from the history books, a revivalist, or someone from God's Word. But who are the men and women? Just thank God for them now. Take a moment to do that.
Jesus just is.